Now, I understand that when it comes to WWE, a lot of fans are not exactly thrilled with the current vibe that they're getting from the product and the creative direction of the company. I can't blame you. I feel the exact same way. And it's understandable. Because you're right. In my opinion, you shouldn't be pleased with the direction of the company from a creative standpoint. You shouldn't be pleased with the product. No matter how much anybody tries to sit there and spit shine this shit and try to present it as a T-bone, it's a turd. And it's a pretty bad turd. A lack of consistency in stories, a lack of storytelling, lack of meaningful character development, just a, a, la a whole laundry list that I don't even really need to go through because we, we've talked about them at nauseum. And now it's also true that at the end of the day, when it comes to the WWE, there is one ultimate HNIC of all that you see, and that is Vincent K. McMahon. And we all know that at the end of the day, nothing gets done in that company at any level without the sign-off and the approval and the input of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. This is something I don't think that anybody doubts. This is not anybody going to sit there and deny this. Everybody knows this. This is an acknowledged, acceptable fact. It's not even like a half-truth or a spin. This is the way it is. Everybody talks about it. Even Vince McMahon acknowledges it and talks about it. So as a result, when you have that ultimate buck stops here guy and everything in that company funnels through him and everything goes through him, when things don't go well, it's very easy to blame that individual because at the end of the day, he had his input on fingerprints on everything. So he does deserve the criticism. He does deserve the blame because he ultimately is the one responsible. He is ultimately the one that is overseeing the problems. He's the one that's overseen the bad that's mixed in with the good. You know, there's a lot to blame when it comes to Vincent K. McMahon. There's a lot to not like about the way he's currently running that company, especially when we're talking about strictly from a creative standpoint. Because in some ways, the product is a reflection of that leadership of Vincent K. McMahon. It's severely out of touch with the times. You can see as well, for a man that's approaching 70 now, you know, we know as you get older, you tend to get more easily flustered. You tend to get more anxious. You tend to be less patient, more set in your ways. And the product is a direct reflection of that leadership in Vincent K. McMahon. Now, it's not only that factor as to why so many things are hot-shotted, things are rushed, things are dropped, you know, there's a lack of long-term vision and booking in a lot of areas, but it is definitely a part of the equation. It's a direct reflection of Vince McMahon and his personal philosophy, his way of life as of now. He's an old, bitter, impatient man, and nobody's going to tell me any differently. He's like your grandpa. He's that old. Think about your grandpa running a business, running a big-time billion-dollar corporation. Is that something you would really want? He's going to be incredibly out of touch. He's going to think that he knows hell-all, even though he hasn't known hell-all for 20-plus years. And he's a guy that's going to be very impatient, going to be difficult to work with. There's going to be so many different things. So, again, it's easy to blame Vincent K. McMahon because he puts himself in a position where he gets all of that blame. And again, understandably so. But I think sometimes what Vince McMahon doesn't get enough blame for is not just what he does, but what he does in terms of the people that he surrounds himself with, that brain trust, that infrastructure that supports him. A lot of times that's where his failings have come. He puts these people in a position of power, doesn't necessarily fully trust them because at the end of the day, they always have to come crawling to him for his sign off, his seal of approval. But he puts these people in situations and in positions that they're frankly over their head in. They're not prepared for. They're not able to do the job effectively. I know a lot of you will point to Kevin Dunn, and that's a perfect example of it. You know, here's a guy that if he went away tomorrow, the company would instantly be that much better off. Because again, like Vincent K. McMahon, Kevin Dunn is a guy that is old, impatient, and is many things. But what I'm always curious about is why somebody like Stephanie McMahon escapes the wrath of so much of the internet fan base or the hardcore wrestling fans. Because when I look at the people responsible 
for the state of the current WWE product. To me, one of the biggest public enemies of all when it comes to an improving product is Stephanie McMahon. It's not just Vince. You know, it's his daughter. And she's in an incredible position of influence and power over that company and has been for an extended period of time. And what fascinates me is that more people don't see a direct correlation between Stephanie's improving uh, stature and growing influence and power in the company and the decrease in the entertainment level of the product as a whole. To me, when you talk about cancers to the WWE product, and I'm speaking specifically about the on-screen product, we talk about Vince McMahon until kingdom fucking come until we're blue in the face, and all of that is probably true. But for some reason, we ignore one of the other really big cancers of the WWE, and that's Stephanie McMahon. And I'll give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. Number one. One of the easiest things for all of us to knock on is the WWE's creative team. We think they lack great ideas. We don't understand why the hell they're in the positions that they're in. We're talking about Hollywood writers and script writers and comedians and actors. You know, all people that have been on the WWE creative team and some in very high positions on the WWE creative team. And it's easy to blame them because it kind of encapsulates everything when we say this damn creative team or this or that. But who's the one that really changed the philosophy of the creative team from it just being, let's say, a committee of a few people that actually understood wrestling, that knew wrestling or sports entertainment, to bringing in soap opera writers and Hollywood writers and these script writers and comedians and actors to be part of your creative team? That was Stephanie K McMahon that oversaw that change. It was Stephanie McMahon who was in charge of that. It was Stephanie McMahon who put that into place. So for all of you that sit there and always want to blame Vince and the creative team, look at who put that creative team in place. Look who's the one that helped shape and shift the philosophy of the WWE creative process and structure of the team to what it is today. It wasn't Vince as much as it was Stephanie McMahon. So you want to sit there and crap on creative, you can crap on them, but you're really not accomplishing much because you're not focusing on the bigger problem. Sometimes it's people that are in over their heads, some people that aren't deserving of the job that they have. You have to point to the leadership. In this case, it's Stephanie McMahon. Even when you go to WWE's website and at a time you go to their corporate site and they're hiring for um, a writer for the creative team, they're not talking about years of relevant experience in the business. They're looking for a degree and have you written for television or soap opera. They'd rather you not have experience in professional wrestling or sports entertainment to write for their product. How does that make any fucking sense in the world at all? And one of the biggest defenders of this incredibly flawed, ridiculous philosophy is Stephanie McMahon. She thinks this is a good thing. She thinks this is a great thing. No, this is stupid and this is terrible. Let's say you're hiring people to crunch your numbers and you're a bank. Okay, are you going to want to sit there and just hire some random schlub off of the street that's never crunched numbers, not an accountant of any kind, to do your fucking books? Especially if you're trying to cook the books to hide shit, which banks are notorious for because the whole thing is based off of a fraud with fractional reserve. Are you going to want experienced bean counters? Are you going to want accountants? Are you going to want people that have done it before and know what the fuck they're doing? Think about it. Those are the type of people that we're hiring for WWE's creative team. We're hiring television hosts. We're hiring newspaper writers. We're hiring Hollywood screenwriters and comedians and actors and soap opera writers. What's one common theme? Most of these people, if not all of these people, other than watching it strictly from a fan standpoint, have any fucking clue how to actually write professional wrestling or sports entertainment television. Does anybody see the problem with this? And then let's look at this. You also talk about the bane of many of your existences, and that is the WWE and their shift to the PG rating. And at the end of the day, that was a Vince McMahon decision. But there is no doubt that one powerful influence over that decision to go PG, and one of the biggest defenders of said PG rating, is Stephanie McMahon. Even against the opposition of her husband, who I think at the end of the day understands the conflict of the product being PG to the level that it's PG. 
A lot of times when we're talking about the WWE, you're transcending past PG to almost to the point where we're getting to a G rating or a, a Y rating, if you will, in television land. It's that bad. I mean, you're talking about fights with no blood. How believable is that? Fights where these guys don't have bruises or cuts. And it's just all of this other crap. But one of the biggest defenders of the PG rating is Stephanie McMahon. One of the biggest believers in the company going to the PG rating is Stephanie McMahon. And frankly, there really hasn't, in my opinion, looking at it from the outside and looking at the WWE's numbers, been a whole lot of financial justification for them going to that PG rating. It most certainly didn't pay off in their new television deal. But again, people will just blame Vince McMahon and somehow Stephanie McMahon skirts this. And I don't understand it. She's one of the biggest defenders of one of the biggest hindrances to that company. Now granted, I'm not one that just blames the PG rating because there are so many other issues. There are so many other issues. And I fully and firmly believe that so much of what this company does, even under a PG rating, can be so much better than what it is if they understood how to make it better. If they knew how to make it better. But again, I point back to who's the one that's put a lot of the creative team in place and oversaw the shift in the creative team philosophy in terms of its structuring and their hiring practices. That was Stephanie McMahon. So it's one problem beginning the other. And then a lot of you don't like how the company is so focused on their philanthropy. Philanthropy, easy for me to say. Talking about Susan G. Komen and their involvement with that organization, the Be a Star anti-bullying campaign, and this and that. Obviously, Make-A-Wish, which has been a big part of the WWE and their beliefs in charitable contributions for years. Well, who is one of the biggest drum beaters for that charitable work of the WWE? It's Stephanie McMahon. Where at times you think that the company is more concerned about touting their charitable work and doing charitable work than putting on the best product they possibly can, you're probably right. Because Stephanie McMahon has even referenced this before, talking about how philanthropy is the new way for businesses in the 21st century. And she's right. There's no question about that. One of the best ways to help your company look good is to give yourself as many situations possible to look good. So when you're doing the tribute to the troops, when you're doing your work with Susan G. Komen and trying to help find a cure for breast cancer, Connor's Cure, Make-A-Wish, what have you, there's no doubt that while the WWE is doing good work in those situations, they're doing it for a selfish benefit to try and help their overall profit margins. And while we might consider it evil and we might consider it terrible, frankly, what American corporation isn't doing their charitable work without some greater good for themselves selfishly from a business standpoint in mind? You really think these companies care that much about their communities? You really think these companies sit there and believe that much in the charitable work that they do? They might believe in it to a part or to a certain degree, but there's no doubt that there are ulterior motives involved. And when you look at the WWE and the level and depths that they go with their charitable work and how far they go to hype up and mention their charitable work, that they have ulterior motives. There is no question about this. And one of the biggest proponents of this is Stephanie McMahon. So if you don't like the creative team, if you don't like how they pound that charitable work down your throat to the point of where you feel that it's exploitation, if you don't like the PG rating, in particular the defense of the PG rating, maybe you should start looking at the people that are responsible for it. One of the biggest defenders and one of the biggest problem causers for this company is Stephanie McMahon. But even beyond that, I'll go strictly now to the on-screen character of Stephanie McMahon. And I understand that there's history there. You see those big fake tits and you see that nice mom body and you say, oh my God, if I could get my hands on her, I would do the one thing that Triple H can't do and that's bear her, give her a son. So you get caught up in the sexiness of Stephanie and the appeal of Stephanie, the looks of Stephanie and the way she can so effectively play a bitch on television because you can believe it, because you believe that's kind of how she is in real life, too. you got to watch yourself around her. Woman, don't you have to watch yourself around, frankly. Uh, that you get caught up in, in how great Stephanie is, and there's no doubt. She does a phenomenal job playing a bitch role. She does a phenomenal job for Stephanie McMahon on television. But that's the problem. 
it's always about Stephanie McMahon, and it's about protecting Stephanie McMahon. For all the gripes and criticisms you can have about a Vince McMahon, one thing I will always say is that more often than not, when he was a major on-screen character, still in my opinion, the biggest star and most important figure in the Attitude Era beyond question, at the end of the day, when business called for him to look bad, when he needed to be made to look a jackass, when he needed to put somebody over, when he needed to be made to look the fool, he did it. And he didn't waver from it. He didn't go away from it. He didn't shy away from it. He understood it. He embraced it. He knew that as important as he was, ultimately it was about these other individuals and that he was so confident in who he was as a heel because he had so many reasons both on screen and off to dislike him that people still to this day would pay big money to sit there and see Vince McMahon get his ass beat. He knew. He was confident enough and he understood it. And that's part of the appeal of a Vince McMahon on television is you knew that in most cases he was going to get his comeuppance and you enjoyed seeing it. Well, when you see Stephanie McMahon, that's the problem. And I think it always comes in part to the problem over the years with female managers and female authority figures because you're really limited in that comeuppance factor in terms of how they're ultimately going to get theirs. It's not a matter of it being sexist. It's a matter of when you look at it, it's a very challenging thing. Like, for years, you had Bobby the Brain Heenan, and you would involve him with his guy in a feud against somebody. Part of the payoff of that feud was to sit there and see Bobby Brain be able to wrestle this guy one-on-one, -on -one or this guy as part of a tag match, and he would ultimately get his shit kicked in. There would ultimately be that comeuppance factor. He would ultimately get his. But when you look at it, you couldn't sit there and do the same type of thing with, let's say, a Sonny, just to give you an example. Well, now you look at a Stephanie McMahon, she's on TV, and she's harping on this guy, and she's harping on that guy, and she's doing this, but there's never really any payoff to anything she's involved with in terms of her getting her comeuppance. There's no cyclical thing here in terms of storytelling with Stephanie McMahon as an on-screen heel, because most of the time she's arguing with the boys, and as great as she could be in a verbal back and forth with somebody like a Daniel Bryan or let's say a Dean Ambrose or a John Cena, whatever the case might be, it doesn't do any good because you get to a certain point and you can no longer go any further with this. You don't have any additional storyline arcs for Stephanie McMahon being involved because what's she going to do? She's going to get in the ring with a fucking John Cena and wrestle him one-on-one? -on -one? No. So the appeal starts to wear off after a while. And that's part of the problem, I think, with the authority storyline now. It gets old on several different levels in terms of how they're packaged and how they're presented. And one of the biggest pro problems with how they're packaged and presented is that Stephanie McMahon can sit there and basically fly in, squawk at everybody, you know, shit all over the place, and then she can leave. And she doesn't get affected. She doesn't get touched. And then even when you do involve her, let's say, in a woman's storyline like what you had with the Bella sisters last summer... You know, part of the whole thing, you know, I'm thinking back to one that was Vince. Vince at some point in time would have ensured that one or both of those Bella twins would have had their moment over Vince, you know, so to speak. Or if he did it with male characters, you know, let's say Rock and Mankind, just to give you an example. He would have made sure at some point in time that he was made to look bad, and those guys were made to look good. But you look at that whole storyline between, let's say, Brie Bella and Stephanie McMahon, it was all about giving Stephanie McMahon a featured spotlight at SummerSlam, giving her a reason to go over, and then you started something between Nikki and Brie, and at no point in time has there ever been any comeuppance for Stephanie McMahon with that. At no point in time have the Bellas tried to rally around each other to go after Stephanie McMahon, and at no point in time has ultimately Stephanie McMahon paid any real price. And it's a problem because you devote a big important portion every week for the most part of your television and your valuable airtime that you have for that three hours of Raw to a character where you get limited payoff and limited return for her being on screen to begin with. Because at some point in time, as much as we want to talk about Triple H and his ego and God knows he got one and God bless one of the founders of the Breakfast Club. But at least to a degree you could say he earned that ego. At least to a degree, you could sit there, he earned that right, whether you want to agree with it or not. What the hell did Stephanie McMahon ever do to earn that right to basically sit there and say, I'm never really going to make anybody fucking look good. It's always going to be about me, and we're always going to protect the Stephanie McMahon character. What benefit does that serve the company? 
What purpose does that serve for anybody involved? I'm serious. And then the one last thing, when you look, talk about the hierarchy of the WWE corporate structure and you look at the way things are today, you know, there's a reason Shane McMahon left. And it's not just because he didn't think Vince was ever going to retire. It's not just because he got anxious and he wanted to be able to go off and do his own thing and maybe he had had enough after all those years involved with the company. There's no doubt there was a part of it he wanted in part to prove to his dad that he could be the guy, da, da, da. But I have to think and I have to believe, and I know I'm not the only one, that at some point in time, Shane could see the writing on the wall. He could see what he was charged with and what he was tasked with and what he was responsible for compared to what Stephanie was tasked with, what she was in charge of, and what she was responsible for. Then he could see with Triple H being involved, Paul, he could sit there and see where things were starting to point, things were really starting to go, and he understood that he didn't want to be a part of this long term, and he decided to exit stage right. That's a part of it, too. So when you look at it, you want to blame the creative team? Who put that philosophy in place? Who put those people in place? Stephanie. You want to hate on the PG rating and talk about how bad it's been and how frustrated you get by the incessant defending of that? Who's one of the biggest proponents and defenders of the PG rating? Stephanie McMahon. When you want to talk about the philanthropic work that the WWE does and how much they pound Make-A-Wish and everything else, down your throat and up your ass and how much it frustrates you because you think they're exploiting these causes for their own benefit when you think they're sitting there focused more on that than they are actually improving their product and their business overall who's responsible for that stephanie mcmahon when you want to talk about the fact that the divas division is still treated like trash even though you have a high-ranking woman in the grand scheme of things when it comes to the wwe and someday you envision she's going to be the ceo of the company but yet doesn't seem to be bothered to give a fuck about the women on the roster. And you want to give Divas a chance and you wish the company would give Divas a chance. Well, who's the biggest hindrance and obstacle, frankly, to those Divas not getting more of a chance? It's not just Vince. It's not Triple H. It's Stephanie McMahon. Because what better advocate would you have for the fucking women in that company than Stephanie McMahon? And do you really think if a Stephanie McMahon actually cared that much and she wanted to, that Vince would sit there and tell her no if she said, well, I want to work a program with this diva. I want to work with that diva. I want to do this, and I want to put this diva over. He ain't going to fucking say no. That's his daughter. And as much as dads will sit there and try to pretend that they run shit when it comes to their daughters, they know at the end of the fucking day that their daddy's girls and those heifers run the damn roost. So you, you hate the way the divas division is? Look at Stephanie. There's public enemy number one. You want to talk about the fact that the authority angle's gotten old to you and there's a lack of payoff and you hate the staleness of how it's presented on so many different levels? Who's one of the biggest causes of that? Stephanie McMahon! So my whole point in all of this is sometimes we fall into these patterns and these traps of focusing on certain things and certain individuals and making it kind of like a broad brush that we paint over with everything and say that's the problem and that's the cause. What I encourage people to do is look a little deeper and try to look at things from a bigger picture perspective. We can sit there and talk about how Vince is terrible for the product and he's a cancer to the WWE product on so many different levels. And I'm not necessarily saying you're wrong, but I'm just curious, is it just the tits? Is it her ass? Is it because of the fact she's a woman and you want a boner? Why is it that Stephanie McMahon isn't viewed as the same type of cancer to the WWE that her father is? Because when I look at the grand scheme of things, for all the bad things Vince has represented for the company, he's represented a lot of good. Whereas Stephanie represents a lot of bad, and frankly, not a whole lot of good. Who's the real cancer of the WWE? Ask yourself that. 